before we went, we were we were terrified what was going to happen because I'd got in touch with some other filmmakers who'd been to China previously. Uh, there was one one woman who'd, who'd who'd gone from Britain and made a film about a uh, a Chinese musician. She had all the proper accredit accreditation. She had a minder with her and everything. And I talked to her on the phone before we went. And she said she still got arrested twice. If all sort of people over the age of forty here probably remember all the sort of Michael Caine, Harry Palmer films and sort of our, our, our uh, views of sort of behind the Iron Curtain or, or James Bond and, and all this sort of stuff. So to actually go to a country like China um, and see, initially see or expecting to see certain things, expecting to be followed by men in a black car and... <laughs> And all these sort of things that you would naturally or <coughs> unfortunately ignorantly think um, didn't happen. You know, as soon as we got there, uh, to see sort of, to be confronted with, with Gucci shops, Chanel, uh, Prada. You think, well, what, you know, what's going on? This is just insane. But as soon as you step outside of that, of that facade and you actually go more into the rural, small, small towns and cities and you, and you see absolute genuine poverty I, th I think the thing really for me was 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 the was the whole yeah the whole contradiction of it's like a police state but with a free market economy and um, it was yeah I weird. think it's I think it has a very surreal quality to it and I think that is evident in the film as well it was much more difficult to get into America than it was into China so we expected to get to the Chinese customs and to be grilled for several hours. And in fact, there were two small girls holding hands who were, who were doing the visa forms. And, uh, and, and, you know, walking around Chinaman Square and filming it, you know, we thought we wouldn't get away with it, but we did. The Chinese government doesn't regard punk music as a valid form of, of, of art. So as a consequence, we couldn't get work permits, work visas to get in there. So we had to pose as tourists to get into the place to play the shows. And it was, it was so easy, we just walked straight in. Uh, it was like walking into a Butlin's holiday camp, you know, it was like, uh, <laughs> off you go, the, the two little girls waved us goodbye and off we went. Cameras and guitars and everything. I think that's what makes the film interesting, <coughs> is, that, is, that, is that if it was a, a film of Sham 69 going to Germany to tour, it wouldn't, yeah. it, you know, the, there wouldn't be the massive, you know, contradiction of things, it wouldn't be the juxtaposition, yes. it wouldn't be as eye-opening, it wouldn't be as revealing as what it is, you know, in going to China. Well, we've had, in also for, for the past 30 years, we've had this incredible music scene, which is a proper community, and we've produced some of the best bands in the world. Radiohead, Supergrass, Foles, Swerve Driver, all these incredible bands, and no one's ever connected that. And for years I'd heard, whenever I hear music scenes described, I hear about Manchester, and I hear about Sheffield, and I hear about London. And when you actually break those down, those are just, they happen for about a year. And they're usually three or four bands who are playing exactly the same kind of music. And it's kind of a, you know, a fast, bright story. Every other town I've been aware of the music scene, it's not actually a scene, it's just a collective of bands who all want to be famous and successful. They're not spurring each other on, they're not inspiring each other, they're not helping each other. They're all just, they're all just using the venues and stuff to, to launch their own insular little bubble careers. But in Oxford, for 30 years, we've been producing bands which have actually kind of shaped music, which have actually kind of created genres and, and changed you know, the face of music. And no one had ever joined the dots with that. So I thought it was kind of, I'd always wanted to document it, but I thought it was the right time to do it because we also, at the time I started making the film, our main venue, the Zodiac, got, uh, got sold to the Academy Music Group, became an O2, well, Carling Academy, then an O2 Academy. And yeah, it was the right time to make a film about kind of, with a base about corporatization, destroying music, which is kind of what it was doing and what it is doing. And also, I've never seen a music documentary which felt particularly real to me. It, it seemed that all music documentaries deified their subjects to a degree and sent out this horrible message, which is, hey, get your friends together, start a band, you'll be rich and famous. And I've been around bands since I was you know, a teenager. And that's not how it works. And I thought Oxford's a good way to show that because we've had some really, you know, Radiohead's one of the most successful bands in the world. 
but their friends, who they respect and who they think are amazing, you know, they, they crashed and burned. There's some incredible archive movie. How did you do I got everyone to empty their attics, basically. I mean, it's the stuff which, uh, which has no meaning. It's the stuff that, you know, you, you put all the stuff from your teenage years into a box, yeah. and you stuff it in the attic, and you think, one day I'll show the kids, and you think it'll never mean anything to anyone. And then all of a sudden, when, when a project like this comes on, it actually takes on a huge amount of significance. And uh, I don't know, I've always, got, I've always had kind of t collector tendencies, you know, which I haven't dragged so much into my adult years. But that kicked off when I started making the film. I wanted everything. <coughs> Is it Radiohead performing at the old... The old yeah, uh, that's, yeah, I yeah, seen yeah. That before, that, yeah. No one, see, even Radiohead, hadn't seen that footage. That turned up. One of their sound engineers gave me a box of of just random Oxford stuff, and it was an unlabeled VHS tape, and it had a full Radiohead gig, one of wow. the early ones that no one had ever seen, and he hadn't even re remembered it. He when when he saw it, he said, "Oh yeah," because he was. Uh, if I was, it was Nigel who was who was going to be here, was doing their lighting design. He'd asked the guy to set up in the sound booth and just film it. And yeah, and it's like, you know, one of the earliest filmed Radiohead gigs. And no one had seen it. So it literally had sat on an unmarked VHS at the bottom of the box. Like I was saying earlier about, about how I wanted to use Radiohead in the film, it was really important to, to do the opposite to them that most films do. And I wanted to undeify them. Yeah. And I actually wanted to show that the only reason they got, and they admitted it, that was amazing. Like in, the, in Ed's interview particularly, I was just like, you know, my heart was beating when he was actually admitting, not this a secret, but when he was admitting that they got signed purely because they sounded like Nirvana, it was the right yeah. band at the right time. And obviously they've gone on and they've paid off on that in, in incredible ways, and they're nothing like they were at Pablo Honey time. But um, it was really important to show that, to show, to show that it was an industry thing. And it wasn't, they weren't recognised for their greatness when they were there. And when that first album came out, no one bought it. You know, Creep yeah. did come in at 78 in the charts. It got horrible reviews. England was the last place they got famous. They, they actually, Israel was, was the one that launched them. Um, and then San Francisco, and then around America. Because there was a really weird time when we were still seeing them playing on Cali Road. And, because this would have been 92, and there was one guy in my school who had satellite TV. And he said, they play Creep on MTV all the time. Yes. I think in the yeah. 70s and 80s, if you're in a band doing something you actually cared about, and doing something original, chances are someone would have caught up with you and, and you could have made a, you know, maybe not a living, but you could have got out there to a degree. Mm. Now everyone wants to be a rock star, so it's very self-conscious and everyone's doing it quite cynically as well. Everyone wants to be famous, everyone wants to be rich, everyone wants to be cool like the bands they watch. And I think that wasn't true with Tallulah Gosh's stuff. I mean, certainly at the beginning of the film, all the bands right up until, in fact past Ride, I'd say, but Ride would be the cutoff <coughs> point. Yeah. They were just doing it because they loved it, and they weren't cool. You know, they, they went off and created cool to a degree. But to Luda Gosh were anti-cool. They were, you know, they were labelled twee, <laughs> which became cool in its own way. It became its own thing. But Mark Gardner actually, in fact, it's not in the film now, but um, when, in the interviews, he actually commented because Ryder credited creating shoegaze as a genre. And he points out that shoegaze was an insult. Mm. They were called feckless shoegazers. That's, the, the, you know, the early, one of the earliest reviews of Ride called him a feckless shoegazer. And all of a sudden, they're now in charge of the shoegaze genre, and it's a really respected thing worldwide. But you know, these guys weren't cool. They just created their own. Their own they made the music they wanted to make, and people got onto it.